Have you ever wondered why breakfast is often referred to as the most important meal of the day, or why you might feel sluggish after a late night snack? Today we're diving deep into the world of how a newer type of fasting called early time-restricted feeding influences our circadian rhythms and may have profound impacts on our health. These circadian rhythms are physiological or biochemical changes that follow a 24-hour cycle. They can be influenced through a number of external signals and fasting, specifically early time-restricted feeding, appears to be a powerful external signal that we can control to optimize our health. Stay with me to discover how mastering your body's clock and the right type of fasting may be a game changer for your immune system, aging, metabolism, and many other things. So stay with me and let's get into it. Welcome to the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. You're now part of a growing community of people determined to take their health back through education and self-empowerment. But because of the healthcare system today, we don't have access to the types of healthcare that we want. So we have to do things differently. We've got to do things smarter, and we do that by becoming our own advocates. This podcast will give you the perspective and thoughts of one of the world's leading Hashimoto's doctors. So let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Shook, and today we will discuss the potential benefits of a type of intermittent fasting called early time-restricted feeding. Now, if you haven't heard about early time-restricted feeding, this is a type of fasting that may be the best way to time when you eat in order to optimize your health and your physiology. I've been transitioning from a fasting schedule that's really loaded to eating my meals later in the day. I would just wake up and continue my fast. I might have I might have like a bulletproof coffee or uh, coffee with a little bit of uh, cream or something like that with fat only and continue and extend my overnight fast and then eat later in the day and have my largest meals in the evening. Now, that is something that has worked pretty well for me. But I have noticed that when I eat larger meals in the evening, it often doesn't coincide with when I'm exercising. And then it does tend to drive me to want to overeat more. So when I learned about this concept of early time-restricted feeding... It was really intriguing to me. And so as I got more into this, I started to realize that this may be a really powerful tool for me as an individual. So I've been trying this more as of late. So basically, I've been transitioning from a 16-8 fast, which is where you fast for about 16 hours, and then you eat within an eight-hour window, loading more of my calories later in the evening to this new earlier eating schedule where I eat my largest meal around 10 a.m. So usually I'll exercise in the morning, typically before I have my largest meal, my breakfast at at around 10 a.m. And then I will eat a smaller lunch and then my smallest meal of the day will be dinner around 6 p.m. So this schedule for me works because I still get to eat dinner with my family, but I eat a small meal, very small meal in the evening, and I stop at 6 p.m. So this helps me to maintain a fasting schedule of 16-8, but it shifts my larger meals to earlier in the day, which is in line with this concept of early, uh, of this um, time-restricted feeding that's earlier in the day. The reason I'm shifting to eating my largest meal first and earlier in the day is a little bit easier to understand if you just think of our bodies as intricate machines that operate on a set of internal clocks. And these clocks are what we refer to as circadian clocks or rhythms. These rhythms determine everything from when we feel sleepy to when our digestive system is most active And our organs, they they even have their own circadian clocks. And even our stress hormone, cortisol, has a circadian or daily rhythm that peaks soon after we wake up and reaches its lowest point around 2 or 3 p.m. when a lot of people have that lull in the afternoon. And these internal clocks are started each day 
by external signals. And one of those signals is when we start eating. And the interesting thing is that if we start to eat at the same time each day, we can begin to entrain these clocks because the, the body will start to anticipate the schedule or rhythm. And this entrainment of our, of our body clocks is believed to be associated with a number of health benefits. And, and conversely, if we're out of sync, health consequences. And there are, there are other signals that trigger these circadian rhythms too. The most, the most impactful of all is the light-dark cycle. So when we're exposed to light, it triggers part of the brain that's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN for short. And, and the SCN orchestrates a variety of biological processes. One of, the, one of the main things and functions of this light and dark cycle is to regula regulate the production of melatonin, which is produced in response to darkness. And you're probably familiar with melatonin. It's associated with sleep. It's an incredible um, antioxidant, and it's really important for our health. So it, it really, these external signals, they influence all kinds of bodily processes. And these rhythms uh, change and influence hormone production. They, they influence our body temperature throughout the day. And when they're off, they can lead to a number of health issues like sleep disruption and metabolic disorders. I mean, this is something that is that is uh, researched within shift workers and and people that that are um, you know have a, a lifestyle or a job that has them awake when we would normally sleep and and uh, kind of counter to the normal uh, light and dark cycle. So optimizing our physiology. And these, these rhythms offers some significant advantages. So early time-restricted feeding, you know, as a dietary concept, is, is where we limit the eating window to the early part of the day, typically finishing the last meal by mid-afternoon. And, you know, in my case, again, it's 10 a.m. until 6 p.m., but it, it could be it could be different. Uh, I think the the major concept here is loading the majority of the calories early in the day rather than at the end of the day. And this approach aligns with the body's natural circadian rhythms, and this offers some potential health benefits. Some of the potential benefits, and there's some research out there that's supporting uh, a lot of these things, is better metabolic health through improved insulin sensitivity blood pressure, and even lower oxidative stress levels, which, which are all fantastic. Better improvements in uh, sleep quality and even indirectly supporting immune function through better sleep because during sleep, the body goes through all these, these various repair processes, including the production and the deployment of immune cells. So this strategy has the potential to have really far-reaching uh, impact. And if you think about sleep, one of the ways that it is believed to help sleep is that you are not eating late in the day. And most of the sleep studies and people that track their sleep, which I highly recommend, I'll talk about that in a minute, it allows you to get into deeper stages of sleep because your body's not digesting food. So you should almost go to bed a little bit hungry. And, and that is something that not a lot of people are are familiar with because usually if they're a little bit hungry intuitively they think that they need to eat before bed or have a little something because they think that they may not sleep well if they're a little bit hungry but i encourage you if you have a biometrics tracking device which i highly recommend uh, i like the garmin uh, watches they're some of my favorite but um, also uh, an aura ring or similar biometrics tracking device that will track your, your sleep, your body temperature, your heart rate, your heart rate variability is a very important biomarker to check. Those are all things that you can use to help get immediate biofeedback about what your body is doing when you make changes like this so that you can see how you as an individual respond and then optimize around your physiological response because everyone will respond differently. But conceptually, and you know, from my personal experience, this is absolutely, you know, a, a, you know, a, a positive uh, impact on my sleep. Uh, and, and I think that is 
one of the most important things that we need to optimize towards is the best sleep that we can achieve. And then, and then if you sleep better, you're going to have improvements in a number of physiological processes. We know that the brain clears cellular debris during sleep, but in particular, deep sleep. And if you don't, if you don't sleep well, the most common problem is that you do not achieve enough deep sleep. And this is, again, where you need a biometrics tracking device. And I recommend, you know, I, I, I wear a Garmin watch. I have a, uh, a ring that also tracks biometrics. And then I use a smartphone application that will actually record and listen to me as I sleep to detect any abnormal sounds, snoring. Because if you have sleep apnea or you have an issue at all with your, with your sleep, that is the first and most important thing that you need to optimize. 100%. So, that I will, you know, I would encourage you to do. Biometrics tracking helps you to understand if any of these conceptual, you know, ideas and things that we're talking about, how they they actually affect you when the rubber meets the road. So, and lastly, the, one of the most important benefits is autophagy. And if you're not familiar with autophagy, it's a term that's been tossed around in, you know, on social media and, um, even in more of the mainstream media over the last few years, but it, it really means uh, self-eating or autophagy, uh, self-eating. And autophagy is how I pronounce it. Some people pronounce it autophagy, you know, whatever you prefer. But autophagy is the body's way of cleaning out damaged cells to regenerate newer, healthier cells. And this early time-restricted feeding may help with enhance autophagy and I think that one of the primary ways that it would do this is through the enhancement of sleep quality. So, you know, it is, it could be a really uh, powerful tool to consider. And uh, I don't, it, it, just to make sure that I was clear about, you know, deep sleep and clearing cellular debris from the brain, there is a, there, there is a part of your lymphatic system, which is part of your circulatory system, the lymphatic system that extends into the brain. And this was a discovery uh, that's been within the, the, the last 10 years. Uh, it wasn't believed that, that this system or a system like this existed, but it was discovered that there's a system called the glymphatic system, okay, glymphatic system that extends into the brain, and that when you're in deep sleep, the pulsation of your heart creates this pump that actually moves cellular debris from the brain and clears it out, kind of like taking out the garbage. And this may be a very important mechanism for proper and uh, and and maintaining brain health as we age. So this could this could be a real problem if you're not clearing this cellular debris. So optimizing for sleep is one of the key things that we need to do. So really. In training, trying to get our body to be in sync and, and on a routine and optimizing the circadian rhythms is very likely going to have significant health benefits. So by controlling our meal timing and loading larger meals earlier in the day when we're typically more active too, this is also important, it may be a powerful you know, external cue that we can control to optimize our physiology. So for me, this is absolutely something that I want to do to further optimize my health, but but I'm tracking my biometrics as I you know really encourage you to do as well because it really tells you how you as an individual are responding, and it can also help you to understand if you're not responding as you would anticipate. It can help you with troubleshooting uh, some of the areas um, where you may need to make some improvement, and then make immediate measurement. You know when you wake up the next day, you sync with your app, and you can see kind of what happened overnight, and you can get a better idea of what works specifically for you. And this is one of the keys to health optimization, not waiting six weeks or eight weeks or however long between blood tests. You need real-time data plus blood testing plus symptoms to, to optimize health and physiology. Okay, so based on our discussion about early time-restricted feeding, the circadian rhythms and their impact on our health, here are my Top five actionable takeaways. Number one, consider early time restricted feeding. So remember, this is a type of fasting where you load these calories more in the beginning of the day. So if it's feasible, experiment with this type of early time restricted feeding. Limit your eating window if you can 
to eight to 10 hours, starting with breakfast and finishing by mid-afternoon. So for me, again, I'm eating my first meal, largest meal at 10 a.m. after I work out. So I'm working out in a fasted state, uh, cardiovascular training um, and or resistance training. And then uh, I'm eating my largest meal. Then I have you know a smaller meal for lunch. And then I'm finishing up at 6 p.m. eating dinner with my family. But it's listen, it's completely reasonable. To, I know that not everyone can have that schedule. So people, I, I, I get this you know a lot where people are like, well, I can't follow that schedule. Well, so you have to find something that works for you. But it's it's completely reasonable to eat earlier in the morning. Like if you like you eat at 7 a.m. And even, you know, stretch this, your eating window. Maybe you're not doing a, uh, you know, a 16-8, you know, fasting for 16 hours, eating for eight. Maybe you're doing a 12-12. Maybe you're eating for 12 hours and you're fasting for 12. That's fine too. That's a great, that's a great schedule. There's nothing wrong with 12-12. I just have worked it out to where I can do 16-8 and that seems to work for me. But um, that's also a reasonable thing to do. And I think that the, the main focus is eating the larger meals earlier around the times when you're more active and the smaller meals late in the day. So, you know, if, if you exercise in the morning like I do, that's the perfect time to eat a larger meal. My metabolism is going to be higher and it works out really well. That's, I've experimented over the years, you know, not, not really knowing about early, early time restricted feeding where I will, would uh, exercise in the morning in a fasted state, cardiovascular training and then you know uh, on on alternate days I'll typically do resistance training and that has always worked best for me for body composition just how I feel and and function and then eat a large breakfast afterwards when I've been my my uh, leanest my most muscular uh, my my uh, you know most optimal uh, physical condition is following that type of strategy exercising in a fasted state typically I'll have uh, some some uh, coffee with uh, MCT oil. That's what I like to do. And then within about 15 minutes of finishing the coffee, uh, doing my workout. And that works really well. So that's tip number one. Tip number two, prioritize breakfast. So you know, start your day with a, with a good breakfast, typically high in protein, good fats, and some fiber. I like... Uh, I like um, if you don't have problems with fermented foods and if you can tolerate things like, um, if you can tolerate dairy, I, I recommend like getting some fermented foods in there. If you can do eggs, I recommend eggs, though a lot of people have problems with eggs. But if you can get in eggs, a few eggs, you're going to increase levels of choline, which will assist with acetylcholine production, which is a neurotransmitter that's essential for memory and, and focus and cognition and learning. And so eggs will give you that choline. Uh, then having something like maybe an, uh, an avocado would be fantastic. You're getting some fiber in there. You're getting some uh, great fats. And then maybe on the side, uh, something sour, typically like I like uh, sauerkraut. I like I like kimchi. Now kimchi can kimchi can be fantastic, but it can also be a problem for some people that have issues with nightshades. And if you have problems with nightshades, there is a nightshade free. I can't remember remember what it's called, but if you would like Google or you search for nightshade free kimchi, you're gonna find it. Or what is it called? Is it called? I don't know. I can't remember what it's called. White white kimchi or something. It doesn't have the spices added to it that uh, are typically contain like nightshades that can be problematic. But that gives you, you're not getting a, a, a this large dump of carbohydrates. You're getting, you're getting uh, good fats. You're getting things to uh, support cognition and brain function. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing, you know, you're really starting off your day, you know, in a, in a, in a good way uh, so that, uh, that's typically a very uh, good type of, of breakfast to begin with. So prioritize breakfast and eat, you know, eat a large breakfast. Eat, get a lot of your, your calories from that breakfast. So eat, you know, several eggs, uh, prepare them however you prefer. Um, I will often uh, cook them in some uh, bacon grease that I have left over or in some butter, uh, some type of saturated fat typically uh, that has a... 
uh, you know, a, a high smoke point so that when I'm, when I'm, uh, cooking them uh, in the pan it is you know I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not damaging uh, the oil and so those tend to work well for me now if you have problems and a lot of people that I work with have issues with uh, various proteins uh, in from foods like casein being a very commonly uh, reactive immunologically reactive protein that bothers a lot of people that have immune issues, well, then we would work around that. We can figure out other ways to do it. And there are, there are plenty of other oils out there that have um, that have higher smoke points that are fantastic to cook with. Um, and then, of course, if eggs are an issue, then you can do other things. Like, listen, I will have a number of different types of breakfast, but um, I like to have eggs for the choline. And then you could uh, you could have things like uh, ground beef, or I, I have, I have, uh, I have significant amounts of uh, of beef or other proteins, uh, and I'll even have those for breakfast. I don't, I don't have this um, this um, preconceived idea of what my breakfast has to be. It doesn't have to be traditional breakfast foods all the time. It can be. I, it could look like a, a dinner for breakfast. I am all for good food, and that's the main thing. So prioritize breakfast. Start your day with a nutritious breakfast, typically, again, high in protein, good fats, and some fiber. And this really helps to get your metabolism going. And if you follow up a workout, it's fantastic. You just refuel your your body, and you're able to utilize that that protein, and uh, and it can be a good way to uh, to do this. Tip number three, stay consistent. Because one of the things that, that we're trying to do here is entrain our physiology. And so our, our bodies thrive on a routine. Well, if you don't know that, they do. They thrive on a routine. So waking up at the same time, going to bed at the same time are huge. Controlling light exposure, going to bed and waking up at the same time are, are they're probably the most powerful signals to entrain our physiology. That's why sleep is so important and it's so critical to optimize because it has so many significant influences on our circadian rhythms and remember all of our tissues have different rhythms and and they're you know the most powerful are the light and dark cycle so try to maintain you know consistent meal times sleep schedules and daily activities and this consistency will help to synchronize these internal clocks and may even lead to better overall health and i think again biometrics tracking Using like I use uh, the Garmin Garmin watches, the Garmin Phoenix watches are fantastic. Uh, you can use um, different types of uh, of uh, of rings that are available. The Aura ring being the most uh, popular ring that's out there. Uh, I've tried um, I've tried a few different rings, and then using an app like the Sleep Cycle app, which is fantastic. Fa absolutely fantastic. You put your phone in airplane mode, put it on your nightstand, and and it will, it will go dark, but it stays on and it listens. So whenever there's coughing or there's snoring or anything like that, it records it. And then it will give you a relative score. It will compare you to other people and you can get great data by combining those things together. Fantastic data. Uh, so, you know, the ring uh, tracks my, my body temperature, uh, heart rate variability, which is the, the time between beats, which I don't want to get into here, but it's more you want a high variability between beats. That is a sign of a, of a more relaxed, more, um, uh, more enhanced state of, uh, of being in, uh, in the rest and digest mode of the nervous system, which is where you're going to have more recovery. So it's called the parasympathetic nervous system. So those things are all uh, very, very helpful. Tip number four, you want to limit late night eating. And this is where really it's probably one of the most significant, I would say negative factors for your sleep quality is eating, eating, you know, I mean, at a very, at a very minimum, you want to cut off your consumption of typically, you know, fluids and, and food three hours before you're going to sleep. And, and that like, that's your, you know, your, your minimum. You know, in an ideal situation, let's say you go to bed at say, let's say 10, 10 p.m., you if you could finish by six, you know, at the latest, you, you've got a four hour window. And, and I see I find that whenever I do that, I have the best sleep. And and, and again, that's one of the things that I think you, you really need to be considering and and aiming for from a from a health perspective is how do I optimize my sleep? Because that changes everything. So many physiological processes occur when you sleep. It sets you up the next day for a much more productive, I mean, productive day. It's, it's just, um, 
you know, it is it is absolutely the most the most powerful domino that you can that that you can play in optimizing human physiology. So that is a, a really important thing. So staying consistent is uh, is really uh, really helpful. Avoiding late night eating incredibly uh, powerful. Tip number five: you want to embrace natural light. So though it doesn't have to do with this early time restricted feeding. It's important that we just mention this if, if we talk about nothing else as far as these external signals that help to uh, signal and entrain our circadian rhythm. Embrace natural light. So exposure to natural light, especially in the morning, helps to regulate these internal clocks. And you want what you want to do is you want to aim for at least 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight exposure daily. And typically you want to get this you know, in the in the morning, what you'd like to do, an, an ideal situation would be, you know, a, a truly ideal situation. This is not what I do. What I do is um, I'll wake up and I'll have typically a glass of water. I'll try to delay caffeine intake by at least an hour, but I'll have I'll have some water, like a large 32 ounces of water, and I'll sit outside and uh, as the sun is coming up, and I'll 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 uh, review. Um, I'll review my um, my plan for the day. I'll look over, you know, if I, once I get through that, I'll look at uh, anything else on my my email or anything that I kind of want to flag or you know clear out the things that I don't need to do and just kind of line up my day as I drink that water. And I'll shoot for 20 minutes of you know light exposure while I'm sitting there. Now you could go for a walk. That would be actually a better way to do it if you could walk. Uh, but I. It may, it's hard for me to get my water intake in and everything that I kind of want to do. So that works for me. I just sit, enjoy the the sun coming up, uh, this, the light exposure, and that light exposure is a signal to my body that I'm awake, and that triggers the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN we talked about, that starts to begin these physiological processes. It's a clear signal that I'm giving to my body every single day to entrain, entrain this physiology and optimize my rhythms. And so the water is the same thing. The water is a signal that, you know, it's a, it's a signal that, um, that um, I'm, I'm getting hydrated at the same time every day. So everything starts working together. And, and this, you know, that matches with our body's natural rise in cortisol, which, which occurs normally in the morning, an hour or so after you wake up, you'll have a peak in your, your cortisol levels. And then throughout the day, your cortisol declines until about two or 3 PM when it's at its lowest. And you know, that, that, afternoon lull that a lot of people experience. And by the way, if you delay your caffeine intake, your your brain is clearing uh, adenosine, which um, which adenosine makes you feel drowsy. Okay, It's a natural byproduct of your energy production, uh, of ATP being metabolized. And so you'll build up adenosine. As you build up adenosine, you become fatigued and tired. Well, when you wake up, if you delay your caffeine intake, which caffeine, one of the things it does is it is it blocks adenosine from binding to the, re- the, to the adenosine receptor. So what happens is if you wait and delay your caffeine intake, your brain clears more of your adenosine and you have natural increases in, in your energy in your energy and, and cognition anyway. If you can delay that by an hour or an hour and a half, then what happens is you've cleared adenosine. Now you already feel more alert. You've had your water. You've had you've had some of these light signals coming in. Then you have your caffeine. And then you get this blocking of adenosine that's been cleared. Now the adenosine's cleared and, you, and the caffeine binds to these receptors blocking the adenosine and you will get a much more significant uh, ben- benefit from the coffee uh, the, or your caffeine. The boost is, it will last longer and you will not experience that afternoon lull in the same way. So that's a, that's a great tip. One of the most important things that I can tell you as far as timing goes. Uh, you just have to, you have to learn to delay that if and train yourself. It doesn't take much work. Um, if you know you can get into to a little bit of a routine, it takes a little bit of uh, effort, but it, you can do it. And so, getting that exposure really helps to set these uh, these rhythms. Now, in the evening, staying on tip number five, embracing natural light. In the evening, what you want to try to do is really just re- reduce blue light exposure because, in an ideal world. You know, as the sun is going down and, and as it goes down, you don't want to be exposed to blue light. You know, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, you know, uh, the development of electricity and the electrical grid, we did not have, uh, we did not have uh, electricity, so we did not have light other than uh, than than fire. 
basically, which which doesn't have much blue light. It's you know the the color is there's not much blue. Which blue is high is uh, is high in uh, in sun in the sunlight. It's uh, as far as the spectrum goes. So you get a lot of blue light exposure, which will um, inhibit your melatonin production. Right. So we talked about melatonin and how important it is, and it will inhibit it. So all of our screens and our phones and everything have. Um, you know, they emit blue light. So, you know, it's been a trend for a while for people to wear blue light uh, blocking sunglasses, which I think are a great strategy to use in the evening, uh, to use filters on our phones, which most phones have them built in now where you can set a light filter that will help to uh, decrease the blue light. A lot of the uh, laptops and computers also have the same thing. Even uh, TVs now have it, have it built into some degree that you can uh, typically enable. But if you have LED lights around your house, those are typically going to be real problems. Um, the, you know, the old incandescent bulbs, those, those don't emit blue light, uh, but they are being uh, phased out. So you want to limit your blue light exposure. And if you can, have dinner by candlelight, uh, if, if, if that's an option for you. And, and these are all things that can help to signal to the body the blue light is gone or diminished and you're going to start producing melatonin. And your your evening routine, like leading up to bedtime, is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical. If you're stressed or if you're getting exposed to a lot of light or if you're doing something that's really stimulating, it's going to be a problem. And so you're going to have to experiment. We all have different lives and we all have different demands. So you're, you, you would need to experiment, but you need to be aware of these things and try to optimize them and then see what does your biometrics tracking device or devices show you what is your heart rate variability what you know what are your how much deep sleep are you getting and then you want to try to go to sleep and wake up at the same time every day and ideally you don't wake up with an alarm clock if you're sleeping properly you do not need an alarm clock to wake up and so um, that is a really important thing to understand and if you're waking up tired and fatigued every day there's a problem so you need to try to optimize your sleep and then you can go much deeper and you can look at your physiology and biomarkers. And, you know, if you need help trying to figure this stuff out, I work with people all across the country and uh, around the world via telemedicine. I'll be happy to take a look at your, uh, you know, have you fill out some forms and go through a process of, uh, of helping you to investigate uh, and how we can optimize your health and physiology. So if you need any help, don't hesitate to reach out to me. But these are my top five suggest suggestions, and you know I would consider implementing those. But you know, as always, the disclaimer: make sure to talk to your doctor before making any changes. And uh, hopefully, those things will help you and get you on the right path. If you found this episode helpful, please share and leave a review. It really helps the podcast. And as always, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can also follow us on YouTube and Facebook at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. You can join our Facebook group, the Greater Hickory Thyroid Support Group with over 11,000 members. And you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Brad Shook. And remember, together, we can make a difference. Remember, it's not just about what you eat, but when you eat. And sometimes it's about when you don't eat. And as the old saying goes, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. I appreciate you joining me today, and I hope you'll tune in again for our next episode. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed hanging out behind the scenes with Dr. Shook. You can also talk with and learn from Dr. Shook through Facebook Live on our Facebook page at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. Don't forget, you can also get access to our videos, guidebooks, and thyroid programs at www.drbradshook.com. Oh yeah, and don't forget one more thing. We can change the world one person, one family, and one community at a time. Until next time, remember, today is your day, and no one will tell you who you are and what you can be.